Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah. Forgive me for being late. I am sorry. Mashallah. I'm really keeping up the tradition of Azhar, you know. We had uh, class sessions that were three hours. And the teacher would come one hour late. This is in high school, not the college, because you know you had to you had to finish at either one of the high schools whose degree was recognized by Uzhoff, which is a handful of schools internationally, or you had to finish high school in Egypt to get into Uzhoff. So I had to do one year of Egyptian high school, <laughs> which was crazy. I mean, I, I had to study math, I had to study uh, history, geography, all in Arabic, which was crazy. But what's that? Yeah, I took private lessons to, to prepare for the entrance exam, but um, you know, the, 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 the material was relatively easy, but but we were, our, our classes were three hours and um, our teacher would come an hour late, sleep for an hour, leave an hour early. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know, that was at the, at the university level, mashallah, they were much more serious. But in high school, they weren't serious at all. And most of us were people from Mesbah al-Buhus. We were foreign exchange students that were just doing it for the graduate requirement. So it wasn't. The only teacher I had that was really passionate about his uh, discipline was my balagha teacher, was my eloquence, was my rhetoric teacher. He was so good. You know, I, I remember thinking there's no reason he shouldn't be teaching at the university level. You know, he would write on, he would write on the board. I kid you not. He would, he would write and switch to his left hand. And just the things that he knew about Balagha, about, you know, Arabic rhetoric. I mean, he was, I mean, he was masterful. I said, he's, he's languishing down here in, in the high school. He should be teaching at the university level, but who knows what happened. MashaAllah, we're still reading the Shema of the Prophet, Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا فمن يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله ثم أما بعده So we're still reading the Shema'il of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام the collection of hadith assembled by Imam al-Tirmidhi and the goal of this uh, maqra Right. Whenever you get together and you're reading hadith, it's kind of a sacred thing. Um, second to only reading the Quran, right? Um, Imam al-Tirmidhi famously said, whoever reads this book, whoever covers this collection of ahadith that I've compiled, uh, it's like you have the prophet speaking to you, right? So um, I realized that many of us go through life and the Muhammad Rasulullah portion of our shahada is kind of like something that's necessary to accept la ilaha illallah and we don't really give it too much thought. We don't really explore it. We don't really plumb its depths, so as to speak. Uh, this book will uh, help us to get acquainted with the Prophet والسلام, and help us to get to know him you know, a little bit better. Uh, we left off on hadith number 65. This is an qayla. No, you know what? We left on, on 67. On 67. Um, عن ابن عباس قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم عليكم بالبياض من الثياب فليلبسها أحياؤكم وكفنوا فيها موتاكم فإنها من خير ثيابكم. On the authority of Ibn Abbas, who reported the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, wear white clothes. Let your living wear them and shroud your dead in them, for white is the best of your attire. It is um, well known that the Prophet وسلم, preferred white clothes. And there's different reasons for that. Um, one thing about white, white, uh, you know, when you, you know, as someone who likes in the summertime white shoes, right? Um, Sanya, assalamu alaikum, how are you? Alhamdulillah. I did not call you Asma this week. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. I was hoping that I would see you just so that I would get the honor of addressing you properly. MashaAllah, alhamdulillah. Um, you know, it's well known that um, 
when you when you wear white clothes, the cleanliness of the clothing is highlighted, right? Um, um, the Prophet ﷺ once said, by way of analogy, um, um, Oh Allah, purify me of sin the way that pure white cloth is purified of dirt. You know, when you see something white and there's no stains, it's not dingy, um, it's, it's quite striking. You know, it's quite striking. Uh, there's, 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 there's no wonder why um, in this country, this is actually an outmoded designation, but people were either addressed, were referred to as blue collar or white collar, right? Blue collar being, you know, people who lab, work in the labor community. Of course, because if you work in the labor community, you would probably sweat. Right, and it wouldn't make sense to have a white shirt. There'd be a, a very thick band of, of dirt around the collar of the shirt. The shirt would become uh, soiled and you would have to replace or change the shirt frequently. But if you wore a blue shirt, like someone that works in facilities management or another kind of labor position, the blue conceals the dirt a little bit better. So they would, re would, prefer, would refer to professionals as white collar and they would prefer to people in the labor community as blue collar, right? The Prophet ﷺ, um, um, enjoyed uh, wearing white clothes. He suggested to people that they should wear white clothes and also the kefin, right? The shroud in which we wrap the deceased is also white, right? Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. An Samura ibn Jundub. قال قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم إلبس البياض فإنه أطهر وأطيب وكفن فيها موتاكم. On the authority of Samura, who said the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said wear white clothes, for they are the purest and the best, and shroud your dead in them. You know, <clears throat> touring um, um, Chad, and I think I was talking about Chad last week. Um, it became uh, one of the one of the reflections that I had while in Chad is that for a person in a you know living in a in a, a pre modern context to be really concerned with issues of personal cleanliness and bodily hygiene was really something impressive. Um, I think one of the um, I guess we can call it a convenience of modern life is we don't really have to get very dirty. Like we don't have to get, I mean, our streets are paved, uh, our walkways are paved. We enter buildings, we exit buildings. When you're living in a place uh, that doesn't have paved streets, you get dirty just by default, just walking down the street. I mean, you just kick up dust and just get dust on your garments. Um, uh, you know, just, just, I mean, you live in dirt is what I'm saying. Like you live in dirt, which is something only people in rural America can even identify with because we really don't live in dirt. But we actually find it to be um, um, like an intentional activity to reconnect with nature, to put on like hiking boots and old clothes to go out to get in dirt right, to go to the woods, to go hiking, to go on the beach, to get sand on, to, you know, to go and get your feet in the sand, etc. They lived in dirt, right? Dirt was everywhere. And in spite of that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was always remarked as uh, having striking white clothes. People would talk about the cleanliness of his clothes. So what that suggests to me um, is that there was a great deal of intentionality expended on being clean. Like it was something very intentional. I, I think that, you know, um, I'm thinking of my wife, uh, Hafidahullah, may Allah preserve her. She's very intentionally uh, clean, right? Um, in fact, I would, I think she would be delighted to hear me refer to her as a germaphobe, right? Doesn't, be before COVID, pre-COVID. You know, of course, you know, won't touch the remote at a hotel room, comes into the room, pulls up the black light, goes over the bedding, will make them change the bedding if she's not satisfied with the bedding. Um, you know, just, and even though sometimes I feel like you're just being extra, this is too much. I mean, 
we run the risk of, you know, coming into contact with germs if we come out of outside of doors. I, I think just to be as clean as the Prophet was almost noted as being, you, it probably takes some intentionality. You have to be pretty intentional about it. You know, I remember um, learning this one uh, story about a man who um, would travel like an hour and a half both ways just to sit with a teacher for like 45 minutes to learn, you know, a few different rulings. They were studying like silk together or something like that. But he was dedicated to this class. And uh, I think the story went that he hadn't missed a session. He was going every day and he hadn't missed a session in like 10 years or something like that. And uh, other than like Eid, holidays, you know, stuff like that. And one day um, he was late and he couldn't, you know, he couldn't, he couldn't make it to the lesson. So that might equal He couldn't make it to the lesson. And um, he couldn't make it to the lesson. He was late. And um, um, he had to use the bathroom on his way. He, he still tried to get there, but he wasn't going to make it in time. And so he had his daughter with him. And his daughter said to him, you know, dad, I've learned that when you use the bathroom, outside of doors, this was in the olden times, you wanna take some time taking your foot to soften the ground around you so that the urine does not splash up and get on your person or on your garment. And he looked and he said, MashaAllah, even though I didn't make it to class, I still learned something today. And you were my teacher today, right? Speaking to his daughter. But the point is the great intention that it took to be um, clean, you know, this is a, uh, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said, Purify yourselves and focus on being clean because only the clean will enter paradise. Some people say this refers to inward purity. Others say this refers to outward purity. I think the strongest opinion is that it refers to both inward purity and outward purity. Um, you know, one of the, one of the that, that should be a hallmark of our community and especially uh, people that enter our restaurants, hotels that we might run, that Muslims pay attention, very close attention to things being clean. People, neighbors entering our homes. Doesn't mean you have to turn your home into like a museum or something like that. I mean, the home should still be comfortable, but there still should be this focus on like cleanliness. Crazy ruling. I mean, like, like check this out. People ask me often, what are some of the craziest things that you learn in Egypt? Right? I mean, you're studying a medieval tradition from hundreds of years ago, right? One of the coolest things, now, if you're not intelligent, it can be very hazardous. People reading those books that were authored six, 700 years ago and just trying to apply them <laughs> just in the, the 21st century, that could be you know, quite hazardous. But getting an opportunity to read a very practical exploration of what life was like in 10th century Egypt or 11th century Baghdad, it was just really, really interesting. So you have this hukum of something called su'r. Su'r, su'r is like drop, droplets of water, right? And this is particularly like the su'r majhul, droplets of water, of water whose origin is unknown. And so they said that if you were walking past a group of Muslim dwellings, meaning places that Muslims live, and something drips onto you, and you're unable to discern what it was that dripped onto you, Right. If the dwellings are occupied by Muslims, you can just pray. You, you can just trust and take for granted. It's all right, it's coming. Uh, you can just trust and take for granted. It's from something pure. You don't know it was water. Maybe it was sun. Maybe it was a he. Somebody was cooking with. It was soda. It was. It was. You know. You can take for granted that it was something pure. You can pray. You don't have to wash the place on your garment. Wash the place on your body. It's all good because people understood Muslims to be very careful about 
things related to cleanliness. They said, but if you walk past a group of dwellings and they're occupied by people who don't share your faith tradition and something drips on you, it's best to take some water and to rinse that off before you pray. Because it could, and you can't discern what it is. Could be alcohol, could be urine, could be something else. The point I'm making is that they would distinguish, saying, well, if the people are Muslim, you can be assured of their cleanliness. Don't worry about it. If they're not, well, we don't, you know, you just, just to be cautious, right? You want to purify the spot before you pray. My point is that this is something Muslims were known for. Unfortunately, in some of our establishments, uh, some of our masajid, you don't see that ethic reflected back at you when you go in. It's like, and in this place, mashallah, is very clean. But it's, it, and, and also too, I think it's, it's also a part of really um, um, experiencing some sanctuary, right? If you enter the masjid and the masjid is uncomfortably, it, there's, a, there's an unpleasant smell in the masjid. Now that happens, I mean, we're human beings, right? The masjid is occupied by human beings. Maybe somebody forgot. Uh, the Axe body spray or whatever they use or something like that. And there's an unpleasant smell in the masjid or the masjid is um, dirty. It, it, it impedes your ability to just be at ease because there's something unsettling about your surroundings. Like, you know, you just can't, and you want the masjid to be a place that, you know, it, you're at ease, you're comfortable. You're not at the masjid because you're like, oh God, there's a roach crawling up the wall. Oh my God, I'm at the masjid. And which, by the way, I've seen before. It's like I'm at the masjid, but I swear that's a mouse running into a hole on the wall at the masjid. It becomes, you know, becomes a, a distraction of sorts, right? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Na'an Aisha ta qalat kharaj al-Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that khadatin wa alayhi mirutun min sha'arin aswad. On the authority of Aisha, who reported the Messenger of Allah وسلم, went out one morning wrapped in a long, wide cloak made of black hair. So this is actually a proof that the Prophet وسلم, would wear leather or would wear rawhide. Or some people say this was a garment of uh, an animal skin, like a fur that he would sometimes, that he would sometimes wear that, particularly in the morning uh, when it would be chilly in uh, Mecca, right? Sometimes the Prophet was this was like, this was like his heavier clothing. An Urwat ibn al-Mughirat ibn Shu'aba an abihi an al-Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam labisa jubbatan rumaniyatan dayyiqat al-kummayn on the authority of Safiya bit Shayba on the authority of Aisha who reported no, I'm, I'm looking at the wrong thing. On the authority of Urwa ibn al-Mughira ibn Shu'ba, on the authority of his father who reported, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa once wore a long Roman, Rumiya, Byzantine jubba uh, that had narrow sleeves. Now, this is actually an important hadith. Um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa among the things that made him unique, and there, of course, were many things that made him unique, is that he did not appear to suffer from any xenophobia. He wasn't uh, put off by things that were different or things that were uh, culturally unfamiliar. He wasn't, you know, some of us, almost as a reflex, if we see something that's culturally unfamiliar, we just reject it without even thinking about it. Just like, oh, no, I don't, I don't, I don't eat that. Oh, no, no, I would never wear that. The, <clears throat> once the Byzantines, right, and this was uh, a part of the, the Eastern Roman Empire, when they learned of the advent of the Prophet, والسلام, they sent him gifts, right? Saying that, you know, we would rather be uh, uh, friends. We would rather be on amicable terms uh, than be adversaries. And they sent him like a Roman, like one of the garments that they used to wear. And, and the distinguishing uh, part of this garment was that it had thin, it had very narrow sleeves. Whereas the Prophet, he would customarily wear a very wide sleeve garment. 
you know, kind of like the peasant style. He wore like a wide sleeve garment. This had very, very narrow sleeves and it was even like tight fitting through the arm. And, and another had, we learned that it had leather strips on the arm. So it was a little more luxurious than what the Prophet I was like, would customarily wear. But he still wore it. He didn't say, wait a minute, I'm, I'm an auto, we don't, we don't, I don't, I don't wear that, right? I, you know, I, I tell my, um, of course, because it was the Roman Empire, Romans in Italy, I tell my wife, you know, wearing Italian suits is sunnah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know, to wear the Italian suit is sunnah. I don't know if she buys it, you know, but the Prophet, he, he wore it, it was no problem. When, when, when he sent the first delegation of companions to East Africa, to Abyssinia, when they came back, they said the Prophet wasn't would practice Tigado or Amharic words with the children. He would say, How do you, of course, they were young when they moved to East Africa, so they learned some of the language. So he would ask them, how do you say this? How do you say, how do you say that? How do you say, he wasn't a person that had this like barrier up of culture that was foreign. Even his sending them to East Africa, the Prophet ﷺ said about the Najashi, he said, go there because he's a righteous man and he's a king in whose court no one is oppressed. So even uh, being able to recognize the virtue, being able to recognize the good character, being able to recognize the righteousness of someone that wasn't Muslim and someone that was from a completely different context, this was never really an issue for the Prophet ﷺ. Um, you know, the most evocative story that I think you see the cultural expansiveness of the Prophet ﷺ is, of course, the story of Banu Arafidah, right? These were a group of newly converted um, East Africans, right? They were Abyssinian, they were Black, and it was the day of Eid. Um, they were celebrating, and they figured, well, everybody is here, everybody is celebrating. We're going to celebrate like we customarily celebrate. So they started dancing, you know, you know, uh, it, it mentions in the hadith, they started, but it was really more like a, like a choreographed military kind of exercise. Like they were kind of going through, like they had like some steps and everybody was dancing in unison. And this made some of the people watching very uncomfortable because uh, you get the sense through reading the hadith they were unaccustomed to this kind of performance. Like, yo, what's, like, what's this? Some people say it wasn't that they were moving in this choreographed rhythmic way. It was just because it was inside the masjid and people were concerned about like, yo, don't mix the sacred and the profane. Like if you wanna dance, step out of the masjid and do your thing, but this is the masjid. This is where we pray. Now, what was what was interesting is that as they were dancing, they were saying, Muhammadun nafsun tayyibah. Muhammad is a pure soul. Right? Muhammad is a good man. Muhammad is a pure soul. Muhammad is a pure soul. And that's, that's what they were chanting as they were dancing. You know what I'm saying? And Sayyidina Omar, radiallahu an, you know, was probably the most uncomfortable of anyone. And he started throwing like small rocks at them, little pebbles, like, Hey, really trying to get their attention. Some people talk about it like he was trying to stone them or something. You know, it's just these. You know, this is why translation is important. It's like sakra, like a like he threw a boulder on top of the dancer and tried to kill him, but just trying to get their attention. Like, hey, hey, no, no, this is the masjid. And the Prophet Alayhi yelled from across the courtyard of the masjid. He was standing in Aisha's house, and he said, "Omar, leave them alone." Let them, let them, let them do what they're doing. Let, don't bother them. And then he, they looked at him, and he said, "Banu Arafidah, raise your voices and show us your moves. Show us your moves. Raise your voices in celebration. Show us your moves." He said, "I want people to know that there is a space for levity, right? To be lighthearted. There is a space for enjoyment in this great religion." Now, if the Prophet ﷺ had been someone that was, uh, you know, a xenophobe. Yo, yo, it's haram. I don't. What is that? I've never seen that before. That would have come out in that interaction. But not only did he protect them, he encouraged them, and then he stood and he watched the performance. You know, Aisha later said that 
the performance was so captivating that she was watching with her chin on the shoulder of the prophet. He was bending down like this and she had her chin resting on his shoulder and she was watching. And uh, after a while, the prophet said to her, okay, Aisha, have you, have you seen enough? I think I want to go inside. And she said, so, so, which in Arabic means shut up. No, this is the truth, man. So is a very impolite way of saying be quiet. Right? It's even more, uskut is not the most, you know, polite way to say be quiet, but so, so, so. It's like, be quiet. They're like, be quiet. Right? Be quiet. Do you know that the Prophet ﷺ responded by saying, um, so, sorry, 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 sorry. Every time I'm thinking about who I am as a husband, uh, especially, I think about this hadith. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a million ways that one could interpret such a statement as disrespectful, as belittling, as like, there's a lot of ways. I mean, you know, the fact that the prophet was so secure that it didn't even bother him. That he wasn't like, so, so, do you know who I am? I'm the prophet Muhammad. I, so, so. I got angels that back me up. You understand? Don't ever say something like that to me. Are you out of your mind, girl? He's just like, oh, okay, okay, no, no problem, no problem, no problem. Then he asked her a second time. Have you, have you seen enough of the performance? She's like, no, wait, 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 wait. On the third time, she was like, okay, I, I've seen enough. Now, something like that happens to one of us in our marriages. Maybe we don't react like huffing and puffing, but at the very least, we're kind of in a funky mood now. It's like, it's like what? everybody's like, what's wrong with you? Nothing. You're looking out the window. Is everything cool? Yeah, it's cool. Man, you know, I don't know how people grew up speaking to each other where you grew up, but where I grew up, people don't say shut up in public and it just go, it just go, it's go, 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 you know, it's go, go crazy, right? They're walking home, right? They're about to enter the, the, the part of the masjid that was Aisha's home. And um, Aisha said, let's have a race. You, you, think you, you think you can beat me in a race? And the Prophet said, well, I said, you know, uh, last time you beat me, but I think I'll beat you this time. Because she was, she was a younger woman and her and the Prophet had a race and she beat him. He said, come on, let's race. So they, they had a race. They had a race to the door and he won. And he looked and he said, well, you, you know, a day for a day. So he was still in a good mood. I'm not even like acting like crazy about it. Now I'm all mad and, you know, no, he's still in a good mood, right? I think that, um, you know, when we think about, you know, and God placed between the hearts of husband and wife, love and mercy. It's not just the love, but it's also the mercy that, you know, we forgive and we overlook things that we don't like. Um, I, I probably would have, you know, addressed that a little bit differently, but I'm sure she means well. <laughs> Inshallah. Inshallah. Khair. This, this was your prophet. So I said, this is the next chapter is Babu Majafi Aishi Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is chapter nine. It only has one hadith in it. Right. This is kind of crazy. Um, this is, no, it has two hadith in it. This is what has been narrated concerning the lifestyle of the Messenger of Allah, alayhi sallallahu alayhi wa what, what was his life like? This is a longer hadith. An Muhammad ibn Sarin, qala, kunna inda Abi Huraira wa alayhi tawbani mushakkakani, mushakkani min kattan. Fatamakhata fi ahadihima faqala, bakh bakh. Yatamakhatu Abu Huraira fi kattan. وَلَقَدْ رَأَيْتُنِي وَإِنِّي لَأَخِرُّ فِيهَا بَيْنَ مِنْبَرِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ وَحُجُرَةِ عَائِشَةَ مَغْشِيًّا عَلَيَّا فَيَجِئُ الْجَائِ فَيَدْعُ رِجْلَهُ عَلَى عُنُقِ يُرَى أَنَّ بِي جُنُونًا وَمَا بِي جُنُونٌ وَمَا هُوَ إِلَّا الْجُوعَ on the authority of Muhammad ibn Sarin, who reported, we were once, now imagine this story, right? Now Abu Huraira 
was one of the old companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Really not that old a companion. Actually came in the latter part of the Prophet's um, mission. But Abu Huraira gave up everything to become Muslim. Right? He moved to Medina. Um, he didn't keep up relations with his tribe. Uh, he moved into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. He moved into Masjid al Nabawi. Uh, and he became a part of Ahl al-Sufla. Um, these were people that were very poor. They had nothing. And they would follow the Prophet around وسلم, just asking him questions, seeing if he would say anything. They were like uh, the fanatics of Islam, but not fanatic, no, wrong word, wrong word, wrong word. Not fanatical in that way. Uh, they embraced Islam with a certain abandon. And that's not for everybody. Some people will embrace Islam, but it's like, yo, my job, my businesses, you know, my relationships in my community and stuff. I, you know, I intend to keep those going, you know, and uh, I'm just kind of adding the truth to my life, adding some religion to my life. Like I have a life and I'm just adding some religion to it, which is the vast majority of us, right? That embrace Islam. Some people embrace Islam with complete abandon. And it's usually a sign of the trauma or dysfunction that they're running from. It's like, I don't want anything that has anything to do with my old life. I'm done with that. Like They take on a different name. Maybe they start dressing differently. They start hanging out in different parts of the city. It's like, now you only see them on Devon Street all the time. You know, it's like, you know, I'm, 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 on a, I'm in a different zone completely now. You know what I'm saying? And it's easy to look at someone like that and be afraid for them because you're worried about the sustainability of that. Like, yo, I don't, I don't want to see you crash because I went down that road. I embrace Islam with that kind of abandon. You know, everything is haram. I, you know, you know, I, I, no burgers, just kebabs, man. Just, you know, just, just, just kebab. You know, I, I went down that road, and you can, you can be quickly and easily overwhelmed by that. Wa salam, rahmatullah. So it's, it's easy to, 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 to fear for someone. But it's also important to recognize that that might be um, that might be a necessary part of their experience. You might not really have a context for why they're going so hard. Like you might see them and think, why are you going so hard, man? It's like, it's, you might think, Adino Yusra, the deen is easy. Like all of these like foreign clothes and spending your time just in Bridgeview and Devon and you know you're wearing sandals in the winter time what are you what are you thinking right but you might not realize that maybe this is something necessary to get them back to a place of equilibrium they might be coming from something so dark something so troubling that just to get back to a place of balance they might feel the need for a religious expression that you might regard as uh, uh, overblown or unnecessary, right? Abu Huraira is kind of like the prototype for people that embrace Islam with that kind of abandon. He gave up everything, right? In fact, his only possession in the world was a little cat, right? Because his name was actually Abd shams and then he changed his name to Abdul Rahman Sakhr ibn al Dosi. But Abu Huraira became his kunya because. He had a garment that had a big sleeve and he would keep a, a small kitten inside the garment. And that's how he became known as Abu Huraira, right? So Abu Huraira is speaking. Now, um, I gave you all of that context to say that this is, these are the humble beginnings from which he came. And now he saw the Muslim community experiencing unprecedented levels of wealth. And he said, we were with Abu Huraira, who was wearing two linen garments dyed in red clay. Now, linen has always been a very uh, exquisite fabric. Linen has always been exquisite. In fact, um, when I think of, and I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm big on fabrication. When I think of fabrics that we regard as exquisite, probably cashmere, silk, we regard as very exquisite, cashmere, we regard as very uh, exquisite. Um, certain wools, like merino wool, you know, we regard as very exquisite. Linen, in terms of per yard, 
is still more expensive than almost all of those, with the exception maybe of Kashmir or Vicuña, some very exclusive wools. Linen is very, linen is, you know, it's linen, man. You know, right? It's linen, right? So now Abu Huraira, who was impoverished for almost all of his Islam, is wearing uh, two linen garments dyed in red clay. And he blew his nose in one of them. So this was a sign of just how much things had changed. Like I was like homeless. He was literally homeless. And now I have linen, I have so much wealth that this fine linen garment, I can just blow my nose in this. Like it's nothing to me. And then he exclaimed, Bach, Bach, which in Arabic is like, look at here, look at here. That's the best way I could translate. Bach, Bach is like, look at here, look at here. Look at me. And, you know, those of us that have experienced that like generational upward mobility, we've had those moments. We've had those moments. I mean, I, you know, just not getting too personal, but, you know, I, drive cars and own things that I never thought that I would have. And I've had those moments driving thinking, me, no, seriously, me, in the GT3, me. Bach, bach, that, that bach, bach is like, look at here, look here, wow. It's like, you know, it's, it's an expression of, um, 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 like you can't believe that this is you. So in a sense, it's an expression of humility. Like, bro, I am from a very lowly background to be wearing two garments dyed in red clay linen, blowing my nose in them. And then he said, Bach, Bach, he said, he's speaking about himself. He said, Abu Huraira now blows his nose with linen. Yet by Allah, there was a time when I would fall unconscious between the pulpit of the messenger of Allah and Aisha's apartment. And I would start convulsing such that a person would approach me and put his uh, foot on my neck because he thought I was losing my mind, going insane or having a seizure. But it was only hunger that I was reacting to, right? You know, one of the subtleties in this hadith is when you see something uh, strange occurring with someone, be very careful about rushing to diagnose what's happening. You know, uh, I actually have a friend who works in the mental health profession. And he said that he sent like 30 people to a friend of his that does gin possession. And he sent all 30 back saying, this is not a gin, this is just mental health. No, this, is, this is not, this person is not possessed by a gin, uh, but rather is having some, um, you know, difficulty that maybe counseling can help them through. Maybe medication might be a more effective way of assisting them, but it's not gin possession. And this person who actually does exercise gin said we should be very cautious about suggesting that someone is possessed. He said the fact that Muslims um, resort to such a grave explanation with such ease should give us great pause. Oh, the person is probably possessed by a jinn. Like what? I mean, no psychiatric evaluation, no counseling, no therapy just to figure out she's possessed by a jinn. Huh? It's probably jinn. No, no, no. Abu Huraira said, I would fall down and I would start convulsing. And a person would come and put their foot on my neck, thinking that something had overcome me or thinking that I had become insane or something like this. But it was just hunger that I was experiencing. That's how hungry I was, that I would fall down and just start convulsing. Uh, the reason this hadith is listed in the chapter, Babu Majafi Aishi, Rasulullah Sallam, is this is how hard the lives of the companions were. This is how hard their lives were. You know, a person told me, if you want to know the difference between the substance of the sunnah and the symbols of the sunnah, you only need to um, 
uh, enter the masjid for Ramadan. And you know, the little dates and the little like pakoras or samosas that we get for like, like we just like, after we hear the adhan, we get like dates and fruit and we get these little samosas. But for us, that's, those are like appetizers. Those are moshowin, man. It just, it's, a, it's an appetizer. The real meal is coming after that with the rice and the meat and the dessert. He said, for the companions of the Prophet and the Messenger of Allah, that was their iftar. The little dates, the little fruit, that's the, that's the, it's over. That's the iftar, right? For us, it's like, no, no, iftar. You know, once my daughter, she asked me, she said, uh, dad, who is iftar? And why do we have to get so much stuff for him? I said, what are you saying? She said, every day in the Ramadan, all I hear people talking about is what they're getting for iftar. She was like three or four at the time. She's like, iftar, 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 iftar. Who is iftar? I said, iftar is the meal that we eat. But her saying that, it, it, it reminded me that we've turned the month of Siyam into the month of time. Right? For us, it's the month of eating. Ramadan is when everybody is making the most exclusive dishes. You know, I mean, some of us, I mean, like me, alhamdulillah, I'm hosted. I mean, we have a very generous community. We have a very hospitable community. Uh, I gain weight in Ramadan, man. Every Ramadan, I gain, you know, three, four pounds. <laughs> just because I'm eating so, just eating so much. You know, I'm thinking to myself, every time I weigh myself at the end of the month, I'm like, somehow I don't think that was supposed to happen. Yeah, right? But this is how hard the lives of the companions were. You know, the, Aisha, radiallahu anha, she said, the home of the Messenger of Allah was maintained on the Aswadain, the two black things. And they said, what are the Aswadain? She said, dates and water, right? She said, sometimes three weeks would go by and not a fire would be lit in any of the homes of the Prophet ﷺ. Meaning three weeks eating no cooked food, just fruits, water, dates, grain, Right? SubhanAllah. Some people say that the diet of the Prophet was, was, you could term it semi-vegetarian. That he would maybe eat meat once, twice a month just because of the circumstances in which they lived. We eat meat once, twice a day. Right? If there's no meat with the meal, the meal is incomplete for us. It's like, well, there's no meat with this. Right? You know, one of the scholars, he said, if you want a practical way of teaching your children gratitude, sometimes serve them food that is not the best of what your wealth can afford. Sometimes it's just bread, some lentil soup. This is dinner. He said, and habituate them to that. He's like, don't blow this for me. Wait, I'm having a piece of the night. I'm not going to blow this. I'm not going to blow this for you. I'm not going to blow this for you. Right. But he said, if you want to teach them a practical way of teaching them gratitude, sometimes you eat dal chavo, man. Sometimes you eat lentils and rice, man. Where's the meat, mom? This is the meal, man. Right? Sometimes my wife, she will serve the kids black beans and rice. And me too. I'm like, babe, what's for dinner? Black beans and rice. And the goal, though, the trick is that you have to eat this with as much gratitude as you would eat filet mignon. Oh, mashallah. Allah is so generous to us guys. MashaAllah, these beans and this rice. I don't think it works. My son is like, Dad, this is beans and rice, man. What do you mean Allah is so generous to us? <laughs> right, but this is a way of habituating them to gratitude, right? If you really want the substance of the sunnah uh, of the Prophet, alayhi Last hadith in the second. من خبز قط ولا لحم إلا على ضفف قال مالك سألت رجلا من أهل البادية ما الضفف قال أن يتناول مع الناس on the authority of Malik ibn Dinar who reported the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم would never eat his fill of either meat or bread unless he was eating with other people I asked a man from the Bedouins, what is dafaf? He replied, to eat with other people. 
So this means the Prophet وسلم, ate just like everybody else. You know, you would think being a de facto ruler of a sovereign nation, that he would have a special meal on an elevated platform and you know, a, a special cook. No, no. The the Arabs, the way that they would dine is that they would put the, the food on a huge sahan, like a huge dish, and everybody would just, you know, get around the dish and eat. The Prophet would eat just like that. He would eat just like that. And he said to Ibn Abbas, Kul min ma yalik. Eat from what is in front of you. Meaning don't grab a portion from in front of anybody else. Don't like take somebody, just, just eat what is in front of you, right? So these hadith are mentioned here just to remind people that the best of God's creation lived a life of great austerity. Right, the best of God's creation lived the life of great austerity. Right, um, we should be very wary of connecting wealth and privilege to the love of God. Who was more loved to Allah than the Prophet And yet, and yet, that love was not expressed in. You know, the Prophet was having a luxurious, um, you know, affluent uh, lifestyle. He was beloved to Allah, but his life was still uh, challenging in certain places and, and, and on certain levels. You know, once Sayyidina Omar wanted to ask the Prophet والسلام, something, and he came in and he saw the Prophet reclining on a reed mat, a hasir, and the mat had made lines in the side of the Prophet ﷺ. And Sayyidina Omar saw this and started weeping. He said, and the Prophet kind of rose and said, Omar, why are you crying? And he said, the princes of Persia and the Caesars of Rome are reclining on silk lined cushions and you're God's messenger and you're sleeping on a reed mat that's leaving impressions on your skin. And the prophet looked at him and said, Omar, aren't you content that God has given them the life of this world and given us the akhirah? Like, this is no, this is no big deal, man. You know, uh, it's mentioned in hadith that the prophet والسلام, uh, said in an authentic hadith, he was given the choice of being a prophet king or being a prophet servant. You know, among prophets, you have kings and you have non-kings. So like Dawood, David, king. Solomon, king. Talud, king, right? These are prophet kings, right? Yusuf, alayhi salam, begins his life, you know, being abandoned, thrown in a well. But by the time he ends his life, by the time Joseph ends his life, he's a ruler. Right? The Prophet ﷺ not only said, I would rather be a prophet servant, he said, if you want to find me, if anybody wants to find me, you can find me among the impoverished. You can find me among the less fortunate. Meaning that's, that's, that's where I feel camaraderie. That's where I feel comfortable. The Prophet ﷺ said, um, uh, uh, Love people that are less fortunate than you and be associated with them, right? So the lifestyle that the Prophet lived, والسلام, this was a self-imposed kind of austerity. I don't have to live like this, but there was something spiritually uh, uplifting that he found in living below his means. Right? Uh, MashaAllah. Um, maybe we'll stop there, inshallah. Uh, open the floor for questions, comments, concerns, um, rebuttals, pushbacks, uh, anything that anyone has, really about anything, anything that was covered today, anything that was covered in previous uh, classes, or uh, anything about any topic, you know, as long as I reserve the right to say I don't know, you can ask anything you want. Yes. I have a comment and then ask the next question. Uh, thank you for sharing the information about Abu Hurairah. Uh, I attended 
for many uh, classes and heard a lot of, about the Bohera, but I've never heard that uh, the name of Bohera is uh, the cat. coming from the cat. So Hurayra. Hilva in Arabic is the cat. Hurayra is a kitten, yeah. little cat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's really interesting. That's true. Perhaps the follow up question would be uh, Abu Ghraib. I'm just curious. Abu Ghraib is one of the most popular uh, people maybe on earth regarding a hadith. Uh, so so he, I'm just curious to know about his life. He ended his life as a wealthy man. I didn't know. I didn't know his life to detail. Well, he ended his life. Um, not as a wealthy man in terms of like ghaniyun or fariyun. He wasn't like rich. But I think he's commenting that even just to have these uh, linen garments, uh, these garments of Catan, and to be blowing his nose in the linen garment, he came from extreme, extreme poverty. And just to be um, stable was a big change for him. There's no reports that indicate that he became rich. A critical improvement in his social status. His social status improved um, the, the level of his living. You know, in fact, in the, the entire Muslim community, um, the, the level of their living increased with military conquests and kind of the spread of Islam. And you know, they came into unprecedented levels of, of yeah, unprecedented levels of wealth. Uh, and this was, I mean, and imagine, uh, you know, uh, Ibn Mas'ud famously said. He said, when we joined the Prophet, ﷺ, we were like shepherds of like goats and uh, cows. And now we're world leaders. That's a, that's a tremendous shift, right? You know, Islam had the practical impact of putting the Arabian Peninsula on the map in terms of world powers. You know, they say that um, Alexander the Great, oh, Iman has a question. Coming to you in one second, Iman. Um, they say Alexander the Great, when, when he was conquering, he got to the Arabian Peninsula and decided to turn around because there was nothing there he wanted. Like, there's nothing. Why would I? Why? why? Not, I mean, so these were really, um, uh, um, um, you know, just desert dwellers, Irenic desert dwellers. And after you know, the death of the Prophet ﷺ, through military conquests and the expansion of the Diyar, these people became, you know, quite prominent and, and, and quite wealthy. Yes, Iman. Assalamu alaikum. It's me and Tariq here. We were talking the other day about Jannah, and one of the questions we were thinking about that we weren't sure was, do you know if people who are in Jannah are able to conceive children? I do not know the answer to that. Whoever says, I don't know, maybe Allah will give them knowledge of what they don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, when I think about um, Jannah, I think about it as a place of complete satisfaction. Um, and a satisfaction that leaves nothing wanting. Right, a satisfaction that leaves nothing wanting. So if a person wants uh, children, uh, I can only imagine that that desire will be satisfied. Now, whether that desire is satisfied through conception and birth, and I have, I have no idea about that. Okay, thank you. Um, we had another question that's completely unrelated. Um, <laughs> Do you know if red wine vinegar is okay to um, to to eat? I guess like if it's in dressings and cooked with. Hmm. I don't know exactly. I mean, it. How's that? Yeah, in the Hanafi school, I'm sure it is. In the Hanafi school, I'm sure it is. Um, but even the 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 istihala. What, what's what's referred to in the Hanafi school is istihala that it transforms into something else through cooking, though. Not just, now, if one were to drink a bottle of red wine vinegar, would they become intoxicated? Does it, meaning, is it, is it, is it, uh, is it muskir, is what I'm saying? Does it, does it intoxicate? It doesn't. 
red wine vinegar, then it's fine. You know, just because something is termed red wine this or red wine that, the um, the definitive feature of 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 something that is haram in Sharia is it has to be intoxicated. I guess the assumption being. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it. That's what I'm saying. But a, that's what I'm saying. If a person even drank a whole bottle, would it? Would they get drunk? Yeah. Right. You. You wouldn't. If a person drank a whole bottle of red wine vinegar, they wouldn't get drunk. Right, it's it's khal, it's 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 vinegar. It's not it's 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 not it's not wine. Yeah, I, again, I I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly, but my I'm leaning toward if it doesn't intoxicate, then it's not it's not uh, impermissible. But if if a lot of it intoxicates, then even a little of it would be impermissible. But if it doesn't intoxicate and it's vinegar. I, I, I would think that it's it's fine for consumption. Okay, thank you. Right, even if it does not intoxicate, if it's something that does intoxicate, right? Like, um, so like, I love Hagen dazs ice cream, but like rum raisin, I don't get that because if I, because I know that rum does intoxicate. If you, if you, now, of course, the small amount that they've included in the ice cream won't intoxicate, but because a lot of it will intoxicate, even consuming a little bit of it is is impermissible, right? And that's that's what she was referring to. If you cook with it, you you cook off the alcohol. All right. So, um, yeah, I believe so. The other the other madhahib, it's because you know one of the things that a lot of people don't know, and you guys are like, yes, we're Hanafi, yes, yeah. yes, we follow the Hanafi madhahib, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Cooking with wine, you know, in the Hanafi method, yes, it, it, you cook it and the, the alcohol is burned off. Uh, in the other madhahib, the question is, you know, khamar also has a, a status of being najasa. It's, 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 it's impure. I mean, if somebody throws beer onto your garment, you actually have to rinse that garment before you pray in it. It's not just that it intoxicates. So the question for the other madhahib is, what part of it is ritually impure? Is it just the intoxicating part? Because the intoxicating part is cooked off. Or is there something else in it that also is, so they, they, they still stay away from it. But, you know, I mean, you know, thank God for the Hanafi school. We go to fine restaurants, we're all Hanafi. Mm -hmm. other, other questions, ideas? Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about, <clears throat> well, let me see. So there, you, you're familiar with the idea of like Ahl Sunnah and Shia. I am. There's like a very uh, common debate that happens between. I, I hate to use the term like to be so descriptive in terms of saying Salaf versus the Sufi argument, but if you let me use the label, sure um, there's often this argument of like, you know, anything that is that we include as part of the tradition after that the Sahaba did not do. Is considered the mm -hmm. And I mean, we know that there's a lot of Muslim countries sure. and cultures that participate in what some would believe to be practices that you know are not practices that were performed by the by the mm -hmm. or sorry by the Sahaba. So what is the uh, I don't know if it's rebuttal is the right word, but what's the kind of the, the push and pull there? Well, I mean, you have two approaches to you know bid that. What, and, and really, you only really have one real approach to bid'ah. For some people, bid'ah is a more inclusive term. And it's almost anything that is invented, um, you know, after the, um, the wafat of the Prophet, after his demise. Other people say you have bid'ah sayyi'ah and bid'ah hasana. So like the tradition of making taraweeh in the masjid every night this is something that is not sunnah the prophet did not do that they said that he prayed tarawih in his home one night but he could be heard reciting and people assembled behind him 
right? This is, I mean, this is just a messenger of God praying out loud. You can hear, so people just gather behind him because you have to realize, give you an architecture lesson, right? Mission and Nebuchadnezzar was like this. You have the, the apartments of the wives of the prophet, are around the masjid, right? This is, this is where he would be sleeping. And the masjid is in the middle. So if the prophet is praying inside one of the apartments, people can assemble in the courtyard of the masjid and pray behind him. You see what I'm saying? He did it one night and it was like a modest crowd because people didn't know that he was going to do it. The second night, it was huge. Every, everybody was there. It was like, you know, it was like the third night, he didn't even do it. Everybody was assembled. They were ready. He didn't even, he didn't do it. They were like, what? I don't want people to think this is wajib. I don't want people to think like, like you have to do this. And then he went through the month. Sometimes he would, sometimes he wouldn't. Sometimes he would pray by himself. Sometimes he would pray with a group. The tradition of praying everybody, every night of Ramadan in the masjid. This was started by Sayyidina Omar. Sayyidina Omar said, you know, I like this. It's a bit of, I like this, right? People getting together to listen to the Quran. This is nice. Somebody said, this is a bid'ah. He says, a bid'ah, hasana. It's a good bid'ah. It's a good bid'ah. The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever adds something into this deen, for who alayhi sallam, who for you rudd, for who you rudd, whoever adds something to this religion that is not from it, that thing will be rejected. Right? That thing will be rejected. Some scholars say the methum al-mukhalifa is also... Uh, Whoever adds something to this religion that is from it, then that thing will be accepted. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, the idea, I mean, so much of what we have now, I mean, the Quran with Tashkir is a bit that. Right? Even, you know, in the time of like, um, if you look at like the Uthmani Quran, right? It doesn't have Tashkir. Which that would make it very hard for us to even read the Quran. It doesn't have like the the bat has a dot and then the you know um, the 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 ta has two dots. It's not like that. It's just written in, in a line like that, right? Adding tashkil is a bit that, and then we add huruf, even 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 more. I mean, lots of things like that. You know, uh, prayer calendars. Um, a lot of the things that people say are bid'a are areas that. Most scholars in Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah say there is tanwiya, there is variation. So, for instance, like dhikr, Allah Ta'ala says, Udhkur Allah. Udhkur Allah. Remember Allah. So, if you want to say, um, La ilaha illallah a thousand times, most people say that's, that's fine. There, there, this, is a, this is a space that we've been left to determine. You have tanwiya, right? But some people will say, if it's not from the Prophet وسلم, to say SubhanAllah 500 times, that's a bid'ah. No. Al-Izz ibn Abdul Salam has the best definition of bid'ah that I've read in my study. Al-bid'ah, it's something, right? Huwa amalun. Ya amal amilu. Yani taqarruban ilallah. It's an action that the person is doing to get closer to Allah, right? Can't be anything mundane. And there is a sunnah for it that the person is opposing. Meaning there's a, there's a sunnah for this. There's a way the prophet did this thing. The person is doing something other than that and then expecting a reward from Allah. That's a bid'ah. So you want to know like a good example of a true bid'ah. You want to know an established sunnah of the Prophet and people don't realize that this is an established sunnah. And all of our conservationist friends will be happy to learn this. Making small use of the water in wudu is a bid'ah. Meaning like if you want to make wudu, right, perform ablution and you want to do it according to the sunnah, don't turn the water on like full blast. Just turn the water just a little bit. In wudu is a is a is a is a is a sunnah, right? Wiping each most of the members three times is a sunnah. The head once, right? The sunnah. If somebody says no, 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 turn the water up really high, 
and wash every limb 10 times. You get even cleaner. You, you super wudu. That's a bidah. See, that's a bidah. Somebody says, no, no. I know the sunnah is to do three. I do 10. And Allah likes this more because 10 is more than three. That's a bidah. You see what I'm saying? Right. Yes. I mean, come on, Tim. So, uh, my understanding, is you know more than I, but my understanding is that uh, the reason of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said about Bid'a is because the other religions that precede Islam have been changed. Sure. And Islam is the final uh, mm -hmm. religion from the messages from God. And uh, Prophet Muhammad was very critical on not changing Islam. So I guess my understanding is that also there is a hadith which is, which may let the bid'ah of the in nar in So, So the main point of stressing on bid'ah, in my understanding, is that there could be uh, specific actions that people will believe that it's good to be done mm -hmm. maybe from your, your their own their own their own understanding their own self or my understanding to believe that well praying for instance that's just an analogy for praying uh every day in the mosque is uh, a good thing because it's good for qiyam so let's do it and let's try to uh make this message for the whole country, for instance, country X, and uh, imams and everyone will push for it and let's do it. Let's be the best Muslim country, for instance. Mm -hmm. This could be better because maybe after a while, 10, 20, 30, 100 years, some people will say, well, Islam is not five prayers a day, it's six prayers a day. Mm -hmm. That's why I think that- the, the, the no, there's, 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 there's certainly an emphasis, I mean, there's certainly an emphasis on abstaining from bid'ah. Um, and, and, and to some degree, I think we've benefited from that a great deal. You know, one of the things that uh, makes me feel really good as a Muslim is that I can enter almost any message on Friday in the world. And I actually know what's happening. I know what's going on. Right, that's, I mean, when you talk about like the preservation of tradition, you could say, I can go anywhere from Malaysia to Southern China, to Chicago, to Central Asia, to West Africa, to Sub-Saharan Africa. If I go into the mosque on a Friday, I don't expect to see anything that surprises me. So yeah, I know, I, I know what's gonna happen. People are gonna sit down. Someone's gonna get up there, he's gonna say something in a language that probably I don't speak, right? Maybe he'll say something in one of the languages that I do speak. Uh, he'll sit down, he'll stand back up, he'll say some more things. Then we will assemble in rows. He will recite from scripture. We will pray two cycles of prayer. He will make a salam and then we will leave. And the fact that we can say that so um, like, that isn't even something that we think of as being special. Like we say that like it's commonplace. Do you know that if you belong to one denomination of maybe the church, you might be completely lost in terms of liturgy and practice entering the church service of another denomination. Like, I don't know what, it's like, okay, if I'm Catholic and I go to a Baptist church, it's like, oh, I don't know. Do I stand? Or, like, I don't, I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do. Right, uh, a lot of that is because our tradition has been preserved, man. The tradition, like Islam, has been preserved. It's a, it's there's a, um, there's a sacredness that we we want to retain. So, even now, um, even in the most liberal Muslim communities, nobody has suggested Juma would be better with a band. We should bring in a band. You know, I, I think it would make the service more relevant. We can get the youth in, you know, because I mean, because of course, I mean, no, 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 I'm just, I mean, you know, because some, some a, a Christian said to me, Christian, now, I, I, I don't engage in 
broadsides or criticisms of other people's faith traditions. But a Christian said to me, were Jesus to return to earth now and enter a church, he probably would have no sense of what was happening. Say, I don't know. I'm not exactly sure what this is. And I said, you know, it actually uh, gives me a great deal of um, healthy pride and satisfaction that I think if the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, entered a masjid, I think he would know what was happening. He said, these are Muslims praying Juma. <laughs> you know, I, I, know, I, I know what's going on here, right? You see what I'm saying? So yeah, I, I think that, um, that ethos is a good one, right? But in terms of how expansive the category or how restrictive um, the category, um, there, there is, in the opinion of almost all of the scholars that I'm familiar with, bid'ah sayyia and bid'ah hasana. There are things that are bid'ah, but they're good, and there are things that are bid'ah, but they're bad. No, it's just, just, uh, just, uh, just uh, kind of uh, um, the way that, you know, scholars look at that statement, the hadith that he gave, kullu bid'atin dolala, and they say this is, this is the am, but the khas is kullu bid'ah sayyia dolala. So you have the, and you know, like Arabic statements, like not just Arabic statements, in all languages, and this is, you know, language is a very interesting technology, right? Language is a very interesting technology. And one of the places that people get confused in language is we use absolutisms, but we really intend them with qualifications, right? Do you see what I'm saying? So if I, if I, if I said to you, uh, Social media is garbage. Social media is a waste of time. Now, that might be a statement that someone might make. But if they came to you and said, well, what about this? A person sends out an ayah of Quran every day. What about this hadith? Are you saying this is garbage? I was like, no, 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 I don't. I, I don't. Obviously, I, I was, my, my, what I was saying was very general. But what I intended was something very specific. You see what I'm saying? This is am and khas, am and khas. In the hadith of the Prophet as well as the ayat of the Quran, some things are mentioned in general. This is this. But then scholars say, no, no, we mean this in this particular way. So, kullu bid'atin sayyi'atin dolalatun wa kullu dolalatin finnar. And every misguidance is a stray goal. Right? Alhamdulillah. Other questions, ideas? Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, we can end there. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa al-Asr inna al-Insana lafi khusr. Illa al-Ladina amanu wa amil al-Sawrihat wa tuwa subhaqi wa tuwa subhaqi wa sabr amin ya Rabbul Alameen. MashaAllah, al-Akh min al-Saudiya. Kuwait. Kuwait, MashaAllah, ahsan nas, wallah. Ma jaa abiki la amrika. I'm here for my PhD study. MashaAllah, ma da tadrus. I'm published and illustrated. الحمد لله وبعد ذلك ترجع إلى الكويت يعني إن شاء الله لا تمكث معنا لا تمكث معنا <تصفيق>